to the middle of the drum section. And as he hit the bass drum, he leaned over to the side, he flipped over his car, and his car turned upside down in the bass drum. And the top of, the, top of his car formed kind of a ramp. Now when the other Shriners saw this, they, they fell into formation. And you know, one at a time. One at a time. One at a time, they drummed the entire drum section. And as they did, their little graduation tassels gave a little wave. Or they crashed, I'm not even sure what happened. Well, when we got back to school after Christmas break, Mr. Poland, the drum teacher, announced to the class that the drummers had been suspended and indefinitely. I felt like my time had come. I raised my hand, and in an instant, I was promoted from seventh chair alto saxophone to first chair bass drum. Man. Now, the bass drum is this huge planet of an instrument, and it has a harness on the front like two beaver teeth. When Mr. Poland called me up to the front of the classroom and hooked those two beaver teeth on top of me, I fell right over like a turtle. I weighed 68 pounds that year. Mr. Poland said I was the smallest player in the history of the world to ever play bass drum. And the history of the world is a long time. It includes the time of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the time of the dinosaurs. Now, Mr. Poland asked the shop teacher, Mr. Jenkins. You know about bass drums, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Poland asked the shop teacher, Mr. Jenkins, to fashion um, two metal kickstands that went on my belt. So when I went out on the field, I would keep my balance and I wouldn't fall over. And when I held the two mallets, it was like holding two big tubs of movie popcorn. That's how big the mallets were in my hand at that age. Now, it didn't matter that every song that I played on the bass drum sounded the same. Now, the rest of the band learned the theme to Rocky. Dun, 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 dun. My part went boom, boom, boom. The rest of the band learned the go-go's. We got the beat. We got the beat. We got the beat. My part went boom, boom, boom. It didn't matter, because I suddenly felt cool. I thought that soon I might grow a mustache, get a girlfriend, and even drive a car. Soon. I felt cool. But the thing is, is that coolness was very short-lived. For whatever reason, the, inviters were invited, the, the drummers were invited back to school for some mysterious reason. And I was demoted from my spot and had my, my role as a seventh chair saxophone player again. I couldn't recover. It was too much to have my dream right there and had it, have it just taken away. And so the next year, I quit the band and I joined the wrestling team. My mom was friends with the wrestling coach, and he called her during the summer. He said there was a position on the varsity squad for a 98-pound wrestler. Now, I had been so depressed over losing my dream that I had spent the summer gorging myself on Slurpees, Cheetos, and Ho-Hos, and I blossomed from a 68-pound weakling into a 98-pound not-so-weakling anymore. And so I found that I found my calling as a wrestler on the varsity squad. I started setting records almost immediately. Do you know, I was the only wrestler, wrestler in my high school's varsity history to lose every match for two years straight within the first five seconds. That's true. Do me a favor, take a deep breath in. Exhale. I just lost the match. Take another deep breath in. Exhale, I just lost another match. I calculated it. By the time you take your next 10 breaths, that's the amount of time I spent on the mat my junior and my senior year on the varsity wrestling team losing every match. Now, no one could understand why I lost every match. I mean, I showed up to every practice, I knew the drills, and best of all, the coach knew that I wanted to be tough. My mom thought it was my acne medication that made me so weak. But I'll tell you what it really was. And it was something I didn't realize until my last match of my senior year. When I hooked up my headgear and stepped onto the mat, I could hear this faint sound in the background, almost like a gentle wind. And like a wind, I knew that although it was quiet, it was quite profound, profound enough to change my destiny. And when I got in front of the other wrestler, 
and waited for the ref to blow his whistle, that wind began to whip up into an imaginary set of trees, and I could hear it rustling through the trees and getting stronger. And the ref, when the ref blew the whistle and I locked up with my opponent, that sound got loud like a hurricane and began to push those trees over, and I could hear that sound. It was very distinct and clear. If you play football, a vessel, you will get paralyzed. Huh? I was confused. My grandmother never said anything about getting paralyzed. But here came that paralyzed, like a pair of pants that descended upon me and squeezed me until I couldn't breathe. And within five seconds, I was pinned. Now, something interesting happened. When the ref raised my opponent's hand, to show that he had won the match, I raised my own. It was the last match that I would ever wrestle in. In that moment, I realized that the mat and grappling with my opponent was a metaphor for the way that I would grapple with life. And as I sat down on the bench and took off my headgear and contemplated two years of losses in my wrestling career, I suddenly knew that it wasn't my opponent that would stand in front of me in my dreams. It wasn't even my grandma's voice. It was me. It would always be me.